Hello and welcome to the second edition of the mini series of panel discussions on how to build sustainable and long lasting partnerships with various stakeholders who contribute very actively and who play a very strategic role in the evolving skill development and vocational education ecosystem in India. The panelists in this series of discussions exemplify what it means to go through this process over the decades working closely with various stakeholders like the government or the industry or to build uh, you know the public private kind of a partnership and get the results that they want to achieve it's something that is really inspirational and i'm so glad i managed to get all three of them together at the same time and have this conversation so I'm so glad to present to you the first episode of this series where we are going to uh, understand the lay of the land which is changing very fast. Many people are quite concerned about how these changes are going to impact them, what is it that they need to do if they are in schools or colleges like the school leadership or the college leadership or also they feel that the more it is changing they are not able to see immediate results. So, I am reminded of this popular French quote, le plus ça change, le plus c'est la même chose, which is the more it changes, the more it remains the same. But actually it is not so. Let us see why and how and I am glad to present to you the first episode with Dr. Gayatri Vasudevan, Chief Impact Officer at Samba Foundation and Chairperson Labanet, Mr. Raj Gilda co-founder Lenderhand India, popularly known as LAHI and Dr. Raj Nehru, Vice-Chancellor, Sri Vishwakarma Skill University, Haryana. So let's get going by understanding how these high-level changes are going to impact training programs and any other work integrated learning program, whether it's a short-term training program or it is a vocational or a skill-based a course at the school level or at the college level we have courses like BWOC, MWOC or any other work integrated program. So let me ask you Dr. Gayatri from your uh, experience, uh, where do you see the changes happening in the vocational education, uh, you know, especially from the VTP or the training providers point of view? Uh, are they still relevant from the kind of work they have been doing in the past, being partners, uh, implementing government schemes? Uh, how do you foresee this uh, in the, uh, like the situation I have just uh, presented to you? So the way I look at it is, see, at the end of the day, strong educational system is the most critical. Uh, you can never uh, replace strong educational system with short-term training. So short-term training is a, um, you know, is at best and will always be remedial. So, uh, foundation has to be in uh, education. Uh, uh, so, and and I I don't say it in uh, uh, you know it's it is not my opinion. The NEP has consulted widely, and that is why the NEP is relevant, right? Uh, what it fundamentally says is that uh, please bring transversal skills uh, to students very early on. Uh, and vocation is a transversal skill. So it is the ability for you to actually have uh, you, um, a, a whole whole personality, right? Uh, is what it uh, it drives to. So I think the, uh, uh, therefore the NEP is positive for me. So to, to sort of go back to your uh, French saying, which I can't pronounce, so I will not attempt it. Uh, so, um, is there going to be change? The change will happen, but the change has to be also something it's... See, education, any change is decadal, unfortunately, right? It's a generational change. It doesn't happen so fast. So what does it mean? Let's just spend some time on it, right? Uh, uh, what the NEP is asking you to do is saying that bring in skill uh, skill education, both at school as well as uh, at uh, at undergraduate level. So, be it your uh, AICT-led engineering colleges, be it your uh, UGC, I'm not discussing medical because I don't have an idea. But if I look at both, there is a strong uh, line of uh, uh, command per, per se saying that think 
integration i think that's the interesting part of it for skill training providers what it means is it gives you pathways uh you are able to actually bring in pathways to students so ideally those who have fallen by the wayside because they walked out of education education doesn't seem to appeal to them can we bring them back into pathways can we bring them back into uh multi entry multi exit pathways can we bring, bring them back into uh modalities of uh, um uh, moving into either higher education or work to me even at work micro credentialing will become necessary so i when micro credentialing happens that means again you have pathways right it's not micro credentialing for the sake of micro credentialing can it be woven together for a for a degree of some kind is very important so i'll just stop in a minute for example in india those who go to polytechnics will uh, are going because they want to go to engineering they couldn't get in at the first time so it's a equivalent of the community college to university and cost coming down right which means when we are seeing what is the percentage of them which are going to go becomes important so for that is where i think the short term training programs will play a, an important role it will not go out out of fashion in a sense yeah yeah thank you dr gayatri for sharing your perspective on this uh, now let me ask uh, mr raj gilda because from here i think we'll move on to the school segment uh, from your experience over so many years uh, how do you see the changes that are unfolding in the school segment and also one more point i'd like to add from what i understood also from dr gayatri is it's not like remedial when we talk about nep related changes happening uh, in the ground level with integration of skills it will be like a proactive approach right so uh, maybe you can highlight some of these things uh thank you thank you thank you madhuri uh I think completely agree in terms of you know to me NEP 2020 is a game changer. You know there have been many policies which have come and gone. So far we all have been you know, uh, uh, there, uh, but having been part of the you know implementation committee now, uh, I must uh, you know share that I am seeing a much larger push towards actually implementation and execution you know, of this policy, right? Which is very hard thing to do. Otherwise, policies are dime a dozen, you know. the actually execution on the ground is what you know goes for a, for the toss right uh, in this and uh, i think well, typically for skill education you know and it being part of the nep being given the you know 110 hours per year you know very fact that you know mathematics is going to have 130 hours and the vocational the skill subject has 110 hours itself is a huge signal to the market or signal to the parents the signal to the teachers signal to the school management and otherwise that how seriously this is being sort of you know uh, taken uh especially at the school level i think uh, what we need to be able to achieve through this you know change in policy or the new policy is that you know typically skill education or vocational education one thinks that it is only for the back benchers only for the poor only for those who are not academically inclined and otherwise so it is like a last option not for my son or daughter it is only for my maid's son or a driver's son or something like that. and and what we are sincerely hoping is that it can change the narrative around skill education that skill education is as much about applied learning you know, in that ki aap aap gardening seekh rahe ho to you will learn botany better right if you are learning electrical wiring you will learn physics better you know so it's not only about just that skill which is of course there but also how does it map with the academic you know curriculum and the skills which we have that is second part and third part being is that life skill in that like many times uh, taking the gardening example further gardening can really make you patient right because you have to you toil it away for 6 months to be kuch bahar nahi aayega it may die still you know and other things too and it really teaches you commitment patience and other things too so i think uh, i i'm sincerely hoping that the integration of skill education within mainstream education also helps us to address this you know uh, sort of uh, uh, perception that it is it is as much about learning applied learning is it is as much about uh, the you know life skill as well and last two things one is the dignity of labor in that right because i think 
that loss of dignity of labor is one of the biggest reason for unemployment. There's no jobs ki to kabi hai nahi. You know, I mean, we all know, right? When we are looking for people, we are not actually finding people, you know, and all that. And secondly, also, I am also hoping ki this particular, you know, policy change will help us to address the gender bias in skilling. You know? They to girls are only doing beauty and wellness. Girls are only doing food processing. Nothing wrong with that. There are great opportunities, you know, in that as well. But how do we have boys such pursuers careers, you know, as well as girls also pursuing the non-traditional job goals too, right? So definitely, it's a great, you know, uh, step forward for the overall education system. I'm very glad to be part. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Raj Gilda, for sharing so many important points, which are actually summarizing the very positive side of uh, vocational education and what are its benefits in a way. Because even today, people are not convinced about so many things that you told us, and we are all struggling hard to, I think, convince them. And it, it is what we are doing today. The discussion is also in that direction. I think mostly the parents need to be also brought into the narrative, which we are trying to do in future. So I'll move on to uh, Dr. Raj Nehru, uh, sir. I also recently visited uh, your university, and as I was, I was a part of you know the research. Uh, evaluation and all what i could see was sir you have achieved something which i think others are finding it very difficult one is b walk and you have also got m walk you know like masters so there is a struggle with even using the name b walk and people in higher education when it comes to vocational they want to call it bsc something ba something bba something that's okay nomenclature wise but how are you managing this and as the vice chancellor of first skill government skill university in india uh, how has been your experience in the higher education segment so thank you very much for asking this question uh, so i was just uh, here overhearing my two other speakers and one important thing that struck my mind before i answer this question is that now the short term education or uh, these short term programs if they really have to become relevant in india aspirational in india one important thing that we have to do is to create a model of democratization of education in india and when i say democratization of education what i mean to say is today if there is a mechanism through which the institutions in india whether higher education whether general education whosoever wants to enter into designing and developing short term programs which are relevant to the local requirements and creditize those programs and offer it to the students across the country and students have a choice to decide tailor their degree based on what is available across the nation which means a student may want to earn some credits from university a or institution a some credits from b some credits from c and this entire freedom is given to the student to decide and determine what he or she would want to learn or what or he or she would want to upskill himself on and that earning of that learning or that skilling whatever credits he or she has earned he or she has the choice to tailor it together into a degree now this is something which is today missing in india but this is something i would want to see that our nation moves in that direction where democratization of this education and skilling is uh, is a, is a unique proposition is a unique idea that india looks forward because we have less time our demography is um, you know going to wither away in next 25 30 years we will not have the advantage of that the second thing when you asked about our bwoc and uh, mwoc programs let me tell you one thing the fundamental reason for why we are continuously pursuing bwoc and mwoc and then also coming up with more bwocs and mwocs is 
that our continuous interaction with industry, the dynamic interaction that we have set up with the industry, the way we have integrated our programs, the way we have engaged industry into design and development of our syllabi curriculum, the way every program is not simply a degree handed over to the student, but every degree program is mapped to certain job roles that are existing in the industry, which are relevant to the industry. And every exit at the undergraduate or a postgraduate level at relevant year, it may be in year one, year two, or year three, every exit is mapped to a mutually agreed job role between our industry partner and the university. And also every faculty has to necessarily, mandatorily work in industry for two weeks every year. So all these things, besides engaging industry experts and mentors of the relevant uh, partnering industry for that program to come and teach students in the campus. So the way we have designed these VWOC and uh, MWOC programs and the way we have engaged industry, the way we have aligned it to their requirements uh, has actually created a demand for these programs. Now, today you see what we do. If uh, we run certain BWOC and MWOC programs, 60% of the uh, credits that a student has to earn ha is coming from the work that the student is doing, which is uh, pivoted around the, where the theory is pivoted around that job that has been agreed with industry. So every BWOC program or an MWOC program will have an industry partner. And that industry partner at the end of the completion of the program has the first priority, first choice to pick up that student for uh, placement or for engaging for any employable activities. So I think uh, these kind of uh, steps that uh, university has initiated has really made these programs aspirational among the youngsters and also desirable for the industry to engage the products who finally pass out from these programs in the industry. So that is why uh, this BWOC program is currently finding a good space in industry and a good demand in the industry. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for highlighting the importance of industry alignment and participation and contribution as you have been achieving, uh, you know, to run these courses and make them aspirational. In this episode, we just heard our panelists discuss important aspects of the emerging changes and what it means for the ecosystem and various stakeholders, uh, especially from their experience and the insights that they have acquired over the years. In the next episode, we are going to look at the funding and finances for the skill development programs, how one can initiate this process and how uh, one can work with various stakeholders to make sure that they get to plan and execute the courses that they have in mind for the benefit of students at the school and college level and even for those who want to take up short term skilling programs. If you found this discussion useful, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell icon so that you don't miss any updates from us. And please feel free to share this among your friends and your professional network. I'm sure they are also going to benefit from this and do write in to us and share your views and your responses or reactions in the comments. Thank you so much for watching. Please look forward to the next episode. Thank you.